Well, so I think we're gonna uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for joining everyone. Uh, I'm here to welcome you to, to, to today's LEAP speaker series event. Uh, we'll be on the topic of uh, sentience titled Sentience is More Complicated Than You Think uh, with our guest, Dale Jamison. So uh, I'm going to begin with some brief background, introductory background. Um, the animal liberation movement has long had sort of deep ties with, with philosophy, which has attempted to give a, a formal theoretical account of something that many of us feel um, that animals matter morally um, and that we ought to behave in certain ways towards them. And a foundational concept within these accounts has been sentience. Um, so many moral philosophers, uh, utilitarians and Kantians alike uh, have agreed that sentience matters for, for moral consideration. And many people generally would contend that uh, scientific advancements have established clearly that non-human animals are in fact uh, sentient. So is that all we need to know? Uh, it's not so simple. Uh, sentience as a, as a concept needs further elucidation and other morally relevant features of our world like agency may have a role to play too. Uh, so in order to help us think through these issues, uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Dale Jameson. Dale Jameson comes to us from NYU where he is a professor of environmental studies and philosophy, an affiliated professor of law, an affiliated professor of medical ethics, uh, an associated faculty member, at the Center for Bioethics and the founding director of the Center for Environmental and Animal Protection. In 2016, he was awarded the Association of Environmental Studies and Sciences, William R. Freud, uh, Freudenberg Lifetime Achievement Award. He has been thinking about uh, science and why it matters for a long time and has been thinking seriously about animals since the early 1970s when he was writing a dissertation uh, in the philosophy of language, he began thinking about uh, human linguistic behavior as a branch of animal behavior. Also at that time, uh, he met Tom Reagan, a very influential Kant-inspired animal ethicist who had written but not yet published his first paper on animals. So I'm especially excited to be moderating this event because Professor Jameson's work has been influential in my own academic path. As an undergrad, I, I was the editor of uh, the Harvard Review of Philosophy when we published an issue titled Animals, Ethics, Agency, Culture, to which Professor Jameson kindly contributed uh, in the form of a published lecture on the importance of thinking about animal agency and not just sentience. So it was wonderful to work with him then, uh, and it's an honor to be able to hear from him again today. One final logistical note before we move to uh, Professor Jameson's presentation. I wanna remind everyone that if you have a question during the presentation, uh, please submit it to me, uh, Jonathan, using Zoom's chat feature so I can read it during the Q&A. Uh, you can access the chat in the control bar uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, please also remember to keep yourself muted for the entire event unless you are asked to unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I will turn it over to you now, uh, Professor Jameson. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for that uh, introduction. And uh, thanks to all the folks at LEAP for the invitation. Uh, time is short, attention is scarce. So I'm just going to jump into it. So I, I want to begin by telling you a story that is very powerful largely true, and has done a great deal of good in the world. So here's the story. Philosophers for centuries were enthralled to two powerful ideas. One of these ideas is that the possession of language is necessary and sufficient for mattering morally. And this is an idea that the philosopher and classicist uh, Richard Sarabji derided as the idea uh, of um, they don't have syntax, so we can eat them. The second uh, idea is that animals are nothing more than organic automata that do not have language, thoughts, or feelings. And this too is an idea that is associated with the philosopher Rene Descartes and has also been uh, the subject of a great deal of parody through, through time. But these ideas were and continue to be, I think in some circles, extremely influential ideas. And it's a consequence of these views that animals do not matter morally. So as this 
familiar narrative goes, in the 18th century, the scales fell from the eyes of philosophers uh, with the writings of Jeremy Bentham. The question is not, can they reason or can they talk, but can they suffer? Language isn't necessary for mattering morally. Reasoning isn't necessary for mattering morally. Suffering is what matters for mattering morally. Now, this is a moment of great insight. Since humans inflict suffering on animals, that is itself unspeakable, both in its scale and in its magnitude. And the most direct route to making animals' lives better is to stop inflicting unnecessary suffering on them. So quite reasonably, a concern to eliminate unnecessary suffering has come to dominate the modern animal protection movement. Now, suffering is itself an interesting and complicated concept. We can ask, for example, is suffering the same as being in pain? Or is it, as some have thought, the second order awareness of being in pain? What does seem clear is that suffering is related to other states, such as pain and pleasure. And so it's not surprising then that a concern with suffering turns to turned to a more generalized concern with sentience. And so sentience comes to be seen in the modern animal protection movement as necessary and sufficient for mattering morally. And the question, what beings are sentient then becomes the central question. For those are the beings that we are bound to protect. So from the perspective of this story, then, good philosophy has done its job. It has essentially driven the bad philosophy out of town and replaced it with a better and more compelling story. What we need now is science to tell us which beings are sentient and activism and law to put animal protection into practice. Now, this story was began to be self-consciously assembled in the 1970s and 1980s, notably in Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation. But I also wanna give a shout out to two other books and authors that are also important to the development of this story, though the books came a bit later and the authors don't always agree with each other. One of them is the philosopher Mary Midgley, whose book, Beast and Man, The Roots of Human Nature, which was published in 1978, was an extremely influential book in bringing animal protection more closely together with biology. And similarly, Jim Rachel's book, Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism, published in 1991, was also an important work on the sort of science philosophy interface side of this story. Now, before I go on, uh, I, I do want to note that there are some small errors in this narrative that I've been developing, which of course, it is the job of pedants and philosophers who are teaching advanced classes to point out. Indeed, it's their moral obligation, professional obligation. But I'm not going to bore you with those things today. What I want us to focus on is that this narrative that I've given you is largely true and has done a world of good. We do need more science. We do need more activism and we do need more law. However, we cannot escape philosophy. And that's in part because sentience is more complicated than you think. So what exactly is sentience? Well, you might think it's a scientific concept. And 
you might think that for lots of reasons, one of which sometimes in popular scientific magazines, you'll see covers like this, Inside the Animal Mind, where the idea looks a little like the intrepid scientist is going to you know, explore these strange uncharted territories inside the animal mind. But my colleague, Becca Franks, did a search on the World of Science database on titles, abstracts, and keywords from 1925 to present. Now, the World of Science database has a bias against publications in the social sciences and humanities. It's much more likely to turn up publications in core scientific areas. Yet, this is what she found, that the plurality of articles published in which the term sentience appears occur in veterinary sciences. Now, some people might think veterinary science is to science, what military music is to music. This is not exactly one of those core areas of scientific research. The second discipline in which articles referencing sentience were most frequent was in philosophy, then in social sciences and then in agriculture, and only then in psychology. And far down the list are areas like biology, neuroscience, um, and other areas where you might think the exploration of sentience would occur if sentience were in fact a scientific concept. The top funding bodies for this research is the European Commission, which uh, is carrying out its animal welfare mandates, uh, but then surprisingly an NGO called uh, World Animal Protection. The major funding bodies in the world are not funding research um, on sentience. So if science has been turned loose to the study of uh, animal sentience, uh, this doesn't really, it doesn't really appear that they're off and running and that a lot is going on in this area, at least not in using this term, sentience. So let's look at the history of this term. Sentience, or at least terms that are translated to sentience, are extremely important in ancient Sanskrit, Chinese, and especially the Buddhist Pali Canon. The Buddhist teachings are directed to all sentient beings, and the Buddhist philosophical tradition provides various competing, highly detailed and sophisticated analyses of what it is to be a sentient being, most of which I am quite ignorant of. But it is, I think, important to, to note that tradition. Now, in European languages, the term sentience derives from the Latin sentire, which refers to feeling, hearing, and smelling. Now, there's an ambiguity in its use, uh, even in classical Latin, that becomes more pronounced through the centuries. And it's an ambiguity between what we might call the sensory awareness sense and the experiential sense. And when the term comes over into English, it actually adds a third sense of sentience, namely that it is responsive to sensory stimuli. Now, my claim is that these different senses continue to be in play and are often confused. So, Let's take Singer as an example. In much of his writing, Singer characterizes sentience as the capacity for pain and pleasure, though he often says this is an incomplete characterization. Now, in his later writings, he has thickened up the notion. Now, if you read this passage on the slide, it does seem quite intuitively compelling, but it contains one of the ambiguities that I have just identified. Sentience in the sense of sensory awareness does not require having wants and desires with respect to that of which one is aware. 
If you've ever had a dentist pull one of your teeth or fill a cavity while you were under a local anesthetic, you may have felt pressure in the place she was working without feeling pain. Even if the dentist was destroying your teeth, you still may not have felt pain. You may have had some sensory awareness of what she was doing and some spatially locatable feelings, but no wants and desires associated with the feelings. Perhaps this is how it is to be a machine, a plant, or even some animals. They may be sensitive to the world, have sensory awareness, yet no wants and desires. They may even behave in ways that we regard as appropriate, yet they may still lack an attitude towards the information that they are processing. Now, I think Singer is invoking wants and desires here because he's trying to vindicate the common intuition that animals, at least many animals are sentient, but plants are not sentient. Yet it is increasingly difficult to deny that plants are intelligent beings with sensory awareness. They communicate information and have epistemic states that are natural to characterize as knowledge and belief. But are they sentient? No, Singer would presumably say, because they don't have wants and desires. Still, it is hard to know how we could distinguish between plants having sensory awareness in response to which they behave appropriately in those cases in which they have an attitude towards what they are aware of. Now it's a viable conceptual distinction, but it's a distinction that's hard to make in practice. Now Singer invokes a further distinction that there's something that it's like to be a possum drowning but nothing that corresponds to what it's like to be a tree dying because its roots have been flooded. But what does this phrase, there is something that it's like, mean exactly? Plants, animals, or AI sensory systems are spatially located and they process information in time. Such beings have perspectives on the world in virtue of their spatio-temporal location and their cognitive and behavioral capacities. In that sense, there is something that it is like to be them. Still, they seem to lack something. So let's just call it by its name, consciousness, or what philosophers sometimes call phenomenal consciousness. Indeed, the psychologist Richard Ryder, who back in the 60s coined the term speciesism and later defended a version of sentientism, once wrote that sentientism could just as well be called consciousism. The Cambridge Declaration, which is often invoked as a justification for recognizing the rights of animals, is the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness the word sentience does not appear. Now, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but consciousness, like sentience, is a difficult concept to characterize and apply, and under scrutiny seems to explode into different senses and understandings. Indeed, some seem to adopt the language of sentience in order to avoid entangling themselves in the difficulties surrounding the problem of consciousness. Going from sentience to consciousness can seem like going from the proverbial frying pan into the fire. In any case, dancing between two difficult and ambiguous concepts does not seem to be a promising path towards enlightenment. Now, you might think that the problem here is with these fancy words, sentience, and consciousness. Now there's some truth to this, but unfortunately not enough. Let's take something simple that we think we understand and in fact do understand. Take pain. 
pain too is more complicated than you think. Many years ago, the philosopher Dan Dennett published a paper called Why You Can't Make a Computer That Feels Pain. The problem is not the limitations of the computer, but the weirdness of our concepts. We say that pain is an experience, that it is essentially bad, and that only you can really know if you are in pain. But when I take an aspirin for a headache, feel better for a while, and then suffer from headache again, is it the case that I had a headache all the while, but only felt it for part of the time? Or did I, for some reason, have two distinct headaches that were separated briefly in time? And what about people who seem to enjoy painful experiences? We even have the expression, hurts so good, memorialized in the canon of popular music by John Mellencamp. Can we mistake one sensation for another? I know someone who thinks tickling is painful. Is it true that tickling is painful for her? Or is she just mistaking, tickling one sensation for the sensation of painfulness? And what about therapy? Can a therapist know that I am in pain even when on the couch I deny it? A lot of real life therapy is gonna turn on how we answer this question. So it seems when I build a robot and I say that it is in pain, I can only be talking between about the relationships between inputs and outputs. But pain for us is something more complex and less broadly coherent. It's bound up with our collective life and the norms that govern it. Now, the same issues arise with respect to animals. So this is a quotation from the UCLA neuroscientist Juan Carlos Marvazan, who says about animal pain, an argument for an animal being sentient may go like this. Scientists are able to measure pain in this animal. Therefore, this animal is sentient because it can feel pain. Now, as one of those scientists who measure pain in animals, let me walk you through what these experiments really entail to find out whether they measure pain or not. So he goes on to discuss reflexive pain measures. Uh, in this case, nylon filaments are calibrated to exert a fixed pressure to the skin of the animal when their tip is pressed against the skin. They're used to measure sensitivity to mechanical pain by testing the amount of pressure that can be applied, say, to an animal's paw before it moves away. Uh, the second technique he discusses uh, is called conditioned place aversion. And in this case, an animal is placed in one compartment and given a hypothetically painful stimulus. Sometime later, the animal is placed again in the box and given access to both compartments. If the animal avoids the one where it was given the stimulus, then the painfulness of the stimulus is inferred. Now, there are other methodologies, but the problem remains the same. And Marvazan's conclusion is that these methods do not really measure pain, which is a conscious experience. Rather, they measure the ability of the body to process and react to a noxious stimulus. Now, um, so the the so let me first uh, get rid of screen share for a moment. Um, right, and tell you what I think the moral of the story is, there is no decisive experiment. There's no irrefutable discovery that will compel the belief in animal sentience, at least in the sense in which it is regarded as necessary and sufficient for moral standing. Now, this may sound bad for the animals, 
but I don't think it's much different for our fellow humans. There are always multiple explanations for what we observe about ourselves and each other. If we favor the most reductive explanations, whatever exactly that means, then we will go with the Harvard psychologist B.F. Skinner, who thought that the power of operant conditioning should lead us to dispose of concepts like freedom and dignity. Now, Skinner's mistake was his failure to recognize that the language of freedom and dignity was never meant to provide dummy variables that could be dispensed with once the science of human behavior was more advanced. This language of freedom and dignity embodies a way of taking ourselves and others, and it expresses our aspirations for the kind of world in which we want to live. In short, it has its own logic. And so it is with the language of sentience as applied to animals. The language of sentience and the states with which it is associated, joy, hope, desire, pain, pleasure, is part of a broad narrative that involves scientific information, but is also saturated with our values and colored by our relationships with the animals who we are trying to understand. So in other words, there are many stories that we can tell, but some are better than others. Good stories will respect science and express our most reflective values. On this view, the one I'm urging, science and values are mutually informing, but one is not foundational to the other. We are always and inexorably seeking the best interpretations and spreading them to others. We thus find ourselves inevitably in the land of philosophy. Now, I want to close with a final thought about the limits of focusing on sentience. In Darwin's later work, which inspired the creation of the field of comparative psychology, he never directly addressed the question of whether animals are sentient. Instead, he talked about animal suffering, and he attributed wonder, curiosity, attention, imagination, suspicion, deceit, courage, modesty, shame, jealousy, revenge, and even a sense of humor to a broad range of animals. In his last book, The Formation of Vegetable Mold Through the Action of Worms, he provided an amazingly detailed descriptions of earthworm activity and behavior, and indeed what he considered to be labor, repeatedly critiquing the notion that we should take the human body and mind as somehow exemplary of bodies and minds. He focused on what he called the mental power and the muscular force of earthworms, urging his readers to think about how topics from sensory awareness and intelligence to the creation of agriculture look when we begin with earthworms rather than starting with humans. What Darwin was doing, in my opinion, was refocusing our attention away from sentience as a concept to these humble animals, the earthworm, as agents. Now, I grew up in San Diego, California, and though our family didn't have much by way of resources, we always had a membership to the San Diego Zoo. And I learned an enormous amount there. And when in 1985, I came to publish an essay against zoos, it almost felt like yet another rejection of my parents and of my hometown. In that essay, I canvassed a broad range of arguments, both for and against zoos. But what I found most appalling was the way that zoos deny the agency of animals. 
even if the animals are being provided with the equivalent of three squares a day in a warm cage to sleep in, or if the animal equivalent of the pleasures that humans enjoy in the Disney movie, WALL-E, or even if the animals are hooked up to machines that stimulate their pleasure centers 24 seven, this is not enough. Sentience matters, but so does agency and the truest and most powerful animal protection narratives will find a place for both. Thank you very much.